The book of Esther is a story about how all the Jews in Persia had been sentenced to death because the king had authorized Haman's decree to execute all of them in one day, but then through his providence, God saves his people. And in this episode of the Following Jesus podcast, we're going to see how God changes everything. Hi, my name is David Cipriano. I'm a youth pastor and my goal is to teach the Bible to as many people as possible. In the beginning of the book of Esther, the Jews had all been given a death date where Haman, under the king's authority, had decreed that all the Jews would die on a certain day. And it seems like the Jewish people are helpless and unable to overcome this. And it seems like their death is inevitable and they're powerless and defenseless. But there comes a time when the tables are turned and everything changes. And in the last episode, we looked at Esther chapter 7, which is the biggest moment of the entire book. It's the moment when it all comes together for the perfect storm. It's where Esther reveals her Jewish identity that she had been hiding and where she asks the king to change the decree. Esther also reveals Haman as the Jews' enemy. And as a result, the king has Haman executed for his evil schemes, and he has Haman hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And when you read Esther chapter 7, you might be thinking that this is the end of the story because the Jews' enemy is now dead. So what more could happen? And maybe you think that since the villain is gone, then now the threat is all gone too. But remember that the law of the Persians was a law that couldn't be changed. And the way that the government system was set up, not even the king could change it. And even though King Ahasuerus would have wanted to, and even though Haman was dead, the law was still there. So there's still a lot of story left to be told even after Haman's gone. And Esther chapter 8 is a story about how God changes everything. And God's already changed a lot and done a lot, but God does even more here. The story of Esther teaches us this, that no matter how hopeless life seems, there's always hope with God. Defeat and loss may seem inevitable, but God has a way of turning the tables, and we don't always know what God's doing or why he's doing it, but he works all things together for good to those who love him, and we see this happening in the story of Esther, how even though there's a lot of bad things that happen, and even though there's a lot of confusing times, God works it all for good, and God is always sovereign, and God is doing things that the people didn't always see in the moment. And as sure as the genocide of the Jews had seemed at one point, God was turning everything around. You know life is a lot like a connect the dots page, because at the beginning of one of these pages, it just looks like a bunch of random dots and numbers, and it doesn't really make sense at first, and you start at dot number one, and then you go to dot number two, and then number three, and so on, and at first it might seem really random and confusing, and you might not know what the end picture is going to look like, and in the beginning, a lot of the steps might seem unnecessary. You might wonder why you went from one place to the other because you don't see the big picture yet. And yet in the end, when the picture has been complete, you can now see the purpose behind all of those steps. And you might not have always known where things were going, but in the end, when the picture is complete, everything makes sense now. And I think that life is often like this, where sometimes God has us in one place, and then he has us in another place, and then God changes our situation again, and sometimes it seems really confusing, it seems random, it seems pointless, but then in the end, we start to see why everything happened that happened, and sometimes it doesn't seem like life makes a lot of sense in the moment. Just like on how I connect the dots page, the picture doesn't really make sense yet, and sometimes in life, it seems like you're getting off track, when in reality, this was a necessary step. Sometimes in life, we may lose sight of the bigger picture, and we might even forget that there is one. But remember that our designer is sovereign and providential, and God, with wisdom and love, cares for and directs all things in the universe. And even when life seems confusing to us, God knows what he's doing. And we see this truth being played out in Esther chapter 8. And in this chapter, we're going to look at five things that happen 
happened, and we're going to see how God changes everything. The first change that happened is that Esther was given great wealth. Verse 1 says, On that day did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman the Jews' enemy unto Esther the queen. So if you remember from the earlier episodes, Haman was an incredibly rich man, and we know this because when he wanted the king to sign his decree, he offered a bribe. And this bribe was incredibly enormous. He offers 10,000 talents of silver. And to the modern reader, we might not know how much that is, but according to historians, the annual income of the Persian Empire was estimated to be about 15,000 talents of silver. And this gives us some sort of idea of just how wealthy Haman was. The fact that he was able to offer such a big bribe shows how rich he was. And so when Haman was executed, Esther receives his house. Now the word house isn't just referring to the home that he lived in, but it included his lands, his goods, his cattle, his money, probably some servants. So to be given Haman's house would be like hitting the lottery. And notice this, before Esther received this unexpected wealth, she first had to do her part. Esther had to be responsible in fulfilling her duty to step up for her people. Esther had put her life on the line, and then later she ends up receiving this money in this house. And I think that this serves as a lesson to us. Don't expect for God to give you blessings in life when you've been disobedient and not doing your part. Our obedience needs to come before God's blessing. And don't expect for God to give you that thing that you've been wanting until you've been submissive to him. Because God providing for your needs doesn't mean that God's going to magically put money in your bank account. Sometimes his provision means him providing you a job. And sometimes we expect God's reward without our obedience. And when we talk about God taking care of us, it doesn't mean that we should just be lazy and count on God. It means that God provides when you're responsible and a good steward of what he's given. And sometimes we say things like God's going to provide for me, and it sounds really faithful, it sounds like we're trusting God, but we haven't done our part. We haven't been obedient to him. And I think about this reality when I see how Esther receives this wealth, but only after she's been obedient. She does the right thing, and then later she receives the reward. So in chapter 8, when God changes everything, Esther is now given great wealth. The second change that we see is that Esther and Mordecai had new power. Verses 1 and 2 say, On that day did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman the Jews' enemy unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring which he had taken from Haman and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. You see, before in the story, Esther had been powerless. She hadn't seen the king in a month. She wasn't very involved. She had been out of the loop. She hadn't even heard about the decree to kill all of the Jews. Likewise, Mordecai has been forgotten. He's unnoticed. He's unrewarded. He doesn't have a lot of power. And he's been sentenced to die, and he's going to be hanged on the gallow. So Esther and Mordecai seem like pretty powerless people. And in the meantime, Haman seemed to have all of the power. He had a lot of wealth, enough to bribe the king. Haman had been promoted above the princes. He had the king's authority. And it seemed like Haman could do whatever he wanted. But at this banquet between Ahasuerus, Esther, and Haman, he's now been exposed and he's been executed. And they give all of his belongings and power to Esther and Haman. And this is a reminder to us that politicians and the government aren't in control because it seemed like everything was final and set in stone, but God always has the final say. God once again turns the tables. And it reminds me of this passage from Psalm 75, which says, For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. And this biblical truth shows itself to be true in the story of Esther. God is in control over everything, and it may look like people are in control, but ultimately God is sovereign. And what we see in the story is that God is putting down the proud and promoting the humble. And as James 4, 6 tells us, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace 
grace unto the humble. You see, God puts down the Hamans of the world and he promotes the Esthers and the Mordecais of the world. And notice something else here, that Haman has gotten to where he was through deceit and bribes and scheming, but Mordecai ends up getting to the same place just by doing right. Proverbs 11.3 says, The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. God rewards the righteous, but he punishes the wicked. And earlier on in the story, the genocide of the Jews seemed inevitable because of politics, but now we see that they're in a better political position than they've been before. There's a Jewish queen who's back in favor. There's a Jewish prime minister in Mordecai. God has turned everything around. And the story of Esther reminds us to wait on God, because God will promote you when the time is right. And even though it seems like the wicked people are getting their way and they're prospering and they're doing well, it's not going to end well for them. Mordecai just kept doing right even though he didn't see the rewards yet, and Haman just kept doing wrong even though he was rewarded in the moment. But in the end, the evil was destroyed and the righteous stayed standing because God's always in control. God rewards the righteous, but he punishes the wicked. And even in impossible situations, God always has a final say. God can change everything in just a few moments. And when God is changing everything in Esther chapter 8, we see that the Jewish people would be saved. And in verses 3 to 6, Esther fights for her people once again. And Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it please the king, and if I have favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? And what we see in these verses is more evidence that Esther cared about more than just herself. Because Esther, at this point, she's safe, she's good, she's protected, she's in power, but she still had a whole people group who was still sentenced to death. And Esther wasn't content just to be comfortable and to see others perish. Esther had to look out for the others. And I'm afraid that many Christians seem to have the mentality that I'm good, I'm safe, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, and they don't give much thought about a world who doesn't know Jesus. And sometimes we're so in our own bubbles and safe spaces that we've ignored that most people are on their way to hell without anybody sharing the gospel with them. And I'm sad to say it, but sometimes we've become so selfish and so me-focused that we've neglected our duty to share the good news about Jesus Christ and how he can save us from our sins. As Christians, we shouldn't just be looking out for ourselves. We should be looking out for others. And Esther and Mordecai have this mentality. They were concerned about more than just themselves. And even though they were saved, they knew that not all the Jews were. And so when Esther goes to the king once again and asks him to change the decree, here's the king's response. Then the king Ahasuerus said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring, may no man reverse. So earlier in the story, the king authorized whatever Haman wrote, but now he's authorizing whatever Esther and Mordecai write. And in the next verse, verse 9, we see the longest verse in the Bible. Now I'll point out that this is not the longest verse in the original language, but in English, this is the longest verse. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month Savan, on the three and 
and twentieth day thereof, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews, and to the lieutenants, and the deputies, and rulers of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, and hundred twenty and seven provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing, and according to their language. So this good news for the Jews is going to be shared everywhere and in every language. It was a universal message for everyone, and verses 11 to 13 tell us what the new decree said, wherein the king granted the Jews which were in every city to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people, and that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. So while they couldn't completely undo this decree, the Jews can now fight back, and the Persian Empire would be on the Jews' side. The Jews could now defend themselves, and they could kill anyone who attacked them on that day, and they could even have the spoils of their enemies. This was really the best news that the Jews could have received, and the news of this new decree had to be shared quickly. Verse 14 says, So the posts that rode upon mules and camels went out, being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment, and the decree was given at Shushan the palace. So when the news was being shared, we see these words hastened and pressed. When you have great life-saving news, it needs to be shared quickly. And I realize that this part of the story of Esther is not about the gospel, but I think that there's also some application for us. Because when it comes to the good news of Jesus Christ and our duty to share it, we need to be urgent and quick because time is running out. What good is the good news if it comes too late? And this is why in the story of Esther, this news of the new decree had to be shared quickly. It was to be shared with everyone and every language, because what good would the good news be if people couldn't receive it in time? So when Haman's decree was neutralized, they shared the news to everyone in every language with great urgency. And when this good news was shared, we see this fourth change, and it's that the Jews went from mourning to joy. Verses 15 and 16 say this, And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white, and with a great crown of gold, and with a garment of fine linen and purple, and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. So pay attention to what Mordecai is wearing. He's wearing royal apparel of blue and white, and with a great crown of gold, and with a garment of fine linen and purple. And remember what he had been wearing not long before, back in chapter 4. He was wearing sackcloth and ashes. He was mourning, he was publicly protesting, he was crying, he was worried, but now there's rejoicing and gladness and joy and honor and feasting and a good day. See, there was now relief where there had been a lot of mourning. There is lightness of heart instead of heaviness of heart. You see, the story of Esther was at one point so dark and hopeless and depressing. Their death was inevitable. But in just a small period of time, everything had changed. God had turned the tables. It always gets the darkest just before daylight. And maybe your life right now seems pretty dark. Maybe you've been feeling hopeless and anxious and depressed. Maybe you feel isolated. And maybe you see no light at the end of the tunnel. But I just want to tell you this. Don't give up hope. Because God can change everything in just a few moments. God can change your circumstances and your emotions. God can give you joy no matter how sad you're feeling right now now, God cares about your mental health. Jesus said in John 15, 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And when God saved the Jewish people, he gave them great joy. And we see this in verse 17, where it says, And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good 
day, the people had been mourning and crying and about to die, but God turned it all around. And as a result, we see change number five, and it's that people were brought closer to God. Verse 17 continues and says, And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. The book of Esther shows us that God uses terrible circumstances to ultimately bring people to him. And through all of the bad things that were happening in the story, people ended up becoming Jews. God often uses trials to bring revival. And maybe you're going through a difficult season right now, but have you ever considered that maybe these difficulties in your life are to bring you closer to God? Maybe God is trying to use the situations in your life to get your attention to help revive you. Instead of asking, why would God allow this? Start asking, what is God trying to teach me? What lessons does God have for me to learn right now? And maybe God, through these situations in your life, is trying to teach you patience or contentment or discipline or gratitude or devotion. God uses difficult times in our life to teach us life lessons. God allows things and God puts things in our path to help us grow in our character. And we see that throughout the story of Esther, the Jews had experienced a lot of great hardship. They had been experiencing racism to the point that Jewish people were hiding their identity out of fear of what other people would do. The Jews had been given this seemingly inevitable death warrant where they would all be killed in one day. And for the Jewish people, it probably looked like God was missing. It probably seemed like God wasn't working and like he was absent. But ultimately, God uses these things to bring people back to him because there's no accidents with God. He has a purpose in whatever you're going through. And maybe you think that God messed up or that he forgot about you. But sometimes you don't know what God is doing until the entire story has been told and you're able to look back and see it in hindsight. So through today's Bible study, we can see that God turns the tables. He changes everything and he gives us great reversal. And in next week's Bible study, we'll be looking at the end of the book to see how it all ends. We're going to see how the story unfolds. So thanks for listening to this episode of the Following Jesus podcast, and make sure to subscribe for more biblical teaching like this.